In this video we're going to discuss how different types of organisms have adapted their mode of nutrition through evolution to fit their niche. First of all you should be able to define what's meant by autotrophic and heterotrophic forms of nutrition and then we're going to go on and you should be able to describe the differences between the different forms of heterotrophic nutrition such as holozoic, saprophytic and parasitic forms of nutrition. And finally, you need to be able to apply that back to the topic that we studied on biodiversity and classification. So you should be able to identify which type of nutrition is used by each of the kingdoms. Autotrophs are basically plants that make their own food by photosynthesis. What they do is to take in inorganic carbon dioxide. And it's inorganic because it has no hydrogen, it's not hydrocarbon and they convert it into complex organic molecules like glucose. So this is the process of photosynthesis, which you'll remember. Now because the autotrophs are the start of all the food chains, they're called producers. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, can't make their own food, um, so they have to consume complex organic molecules like glucose, and it passes down the food chain. Obviously all the food chains start here with the producer. Heterotrophs can be divided up according to what they eat and how they eat it. So holozoic feeders um, take in their food inside their body and they secrete the enzymes in their gut, digest everything internally and then absorb it into their bloodstream normally or into their tissues. These guys here eat only plant material, so they're called herbivores, whereas these animals eat only meat or other animals, so they're called carnivores. And here we are, um, and also the bear. Um, and they're omnivores because they eat both plant material and animals. And then there's another group like the wood lice and the, the little organisms that eat dead, decaying matter. They're called detritivores. The next group we're going to look at are the saprophytes, sometimes known as the saprobionts. And the saprobionts um, carry out extracellular digestion. So they secrete enzymes out onto their food. This is a, a mould here. Um, and these are the hyphae. They'll secrete the enzymes like cellulases, proteases, amylase, out onto their food and that will break down the big organic molecules like starch and cellulose and then the little molecules like glucose will be absorbed back into the hyphae of the mycelium to feed the mould. This is a really important process because it's the process of decay. Our last group here are the parasites. Um, parasites are organisms that feed on another living organism which is called the host and some parasites live inside the host, they're called endoparasites whereas others live outside the host, like fleas, and they're called ectoparasites. This is a really one-sided relationship, because while the parasite benefits, the host always always suffers some harm, and, and potentially could die from the parasite. Parasites are highly specialised organisms that have evolved to become really well adapted to their environment inside or outside the host. The example we're going to study here is the pork tapeworm, um, and the pork tapeworm has two hosts, humans and pigs. The adult tapeworm here lives in the human gut. And the adult tapeworm is basically a long, flat, thin ribbon made up of segments called proglottids. Now these proglottids contain both male and female reproductive organs so they self-fertilize 
and when they're mature the end progotids just drop off and obviously then they're ingested out in, in the faeces so here's the eggs being ingested in the faeces now if you don't have very good sewage um, disposal or hygiene then you might have animals like our piggy here grazing in a field where there could be human faeces and they might ingest the eggs once the eggs are inside the pig then they emerge as larvae and then they burrow into the pig's tissues, into the meat. Um, then they form cysts which are resistant survival strategies. Now the problem comes if when the pig is slaughtered for meat the meat's not inspected thoroughly to see if it's got parasites in it and also if it's not cooked thoroughly which could kill the cysts then the undercooked meat is ingested by the human down go the cysts and they hatch into the beginning of another adult tapeworm. Now although you might think this is a pretty easy life, you know, you're lying around in a gut, surrounded by food, it's nice and warm, actually living inside the human gut poses a number of challenges to the tapeworms. So I suggest you stop the video now and think what problems the tapeworm might face living inside a gut. When you're ready then just go on to the next slide. OK, so here's a tapeworm. You might have come up with any of the following. Um, inside the gut is surrounded by digestive enzymes, which could actually digest the tapeworm. Obviously, the gut's undergoing peristalsis all the time, wriggling around, which might dislodge it. Um, the pH changes in the stomach. It's very acidic. Later on in the gut, it's quite alkali. The host, the human host, obviously has quite a sophisticated immune system, so it might use that to attack the worm in the gut. Obviously, if the host dies, then so does the parasite. And you might also be able to see some of the problems, such as how is it going to get from one host to another safely? And of course, inside a human gut, you're unlikely to have more than one 10, 10 metre long tapeworm. So reproducing is going to be quite difficult. It's going to have to reproduce on its own. So how is this tapeworm ad adapted to its environment? Well, it has both structural and reproductive adaptations. First of all, if you look at the previous slide again, and you take a look at the photograph of the head region here, it has suckers and a double row of curved hooks with which it latches onto the host gut. And then it has a, a body covering which is resistant to the host immune responses. And it has a thick cuticle and it produces inhibitory substances so that it doesn't get digested by the host enzymes. The worm's gone for pretty much simplicity. All these proglottids or segments are pretty much identical. These are the mature ones, these are the immature ones here, and this is the scolex or the head here. So one of the simplifications that the worm has gone through is it's eliminated the need for any sensory organs because obviously it's living in a pretty stable environment which is dark so no point having eyes um, this thin ribbon structure gives it a large surface area to volume ratio so it can absorb food over its entire surface another adaptation is in, in its reproduction as we said there, there isn't really space in a, in a gut for two worms they'd be in competition for food so each worm has to reproduce on its own. Now this is a mature proglottid here and inside it it's got both male and female organs producing both sperm and eggs. So the worm's basically hermaphrodite. When the segments are mature then they're shed from the body in the faeces and each of these segments can contain about 40,000 eggs. Finally, the eggs themselves have to survive obviously outside the human host until they get eaten by a pig host, and so the eggs have a resistant coat that allows them to survive. Now while this might look like a good life for a tapeworm, it's not so good for the host. Um, most people wouldn't even know if they had a tapeworm, it doesn't cause a huge amount of dis discomfort, but obviously they'll lose weight, they're losing some of their food. But more importantly, some of the cysts will lodge in tissues other than the gut, and they can lodge in the brain, um, and they can damage the surrounding tissues. That can be treated with drugs to eliminate the worm, 
And another way of actually preventing it is to have really good public health and meat inspection. OK, now we're going to contrast the adaptations of herbivores and carnivores to their particular diet. When we think about herbivores, we've got to go back to BY1 and think about the structure of cellulose, we'll remember that. And then we've got to be able to explain why animals find cellulose hard to digest, but also why they actually need cellulose in their diet. Now if you recall, cellulose is a long po linear polymer made out of beta-glucose, bonded 1 to 4, and in order to get these long straight chains, every alternate beta-glucose monomer has to be inverted by 180 degrees. Now the reason that that's difficult for animals to digest is that animals don't produce cellulase, they don't produce the enzyme that can hydrolyse that beta-1 to 4 bond. Even though animals can't digest cellulose on their own, um, they still need it in their diet because it forms fibre, which gives the peristalsis of the gut something to work on, and moves the waste food that you're not going to absorb through the gut so it can be ingested as faeces. Now we're going to take a look at adaptations for a herbivorous or carnivorous diet. Now the first thing you'll notice is that the herbivore's gut is really long. And it has this enormous structure here, the appendix and cecum. Whereas the carnivore's gut, excuse the American spelling there, the carnivore's gut is relatively short. And the appendix and cecum have been reduced to what we call a vestigial organ, which means it's basically redundant, it doesn't really do anything anymore. And that reflects its carnivorous diet. The herbivore has this long gut because of the fact that cellulose is so difficult to digest, so it's going to take longer. Notice this is a non-ruminant herbivore. We'll come back to ruminants in a second. But we've already said animals don't produce cellulase. This is where this big cecum structure comes in. Inside the cecum um, are mutualistic bacteria. Mutualistic means that both the host the rabbit and the bacteria benefit. So the bacteria do secrete cellulase and they break down the cellulose into beta glucose which the rabbit can then use and obviously the bacteria also use it. Even this long gut doesn't give the rabbit enough time to digest and absorb all of the cellulase so they have a rather unpleasant habit called coprophagy where they eat the grass the first time, it passes through their gut, and they ingest little green sloppy faeces, um, and then they eat those again and have another go, and then they produce those little brown pellets at the end because they've managed to extract an awful lot of the nutrients from, from the cellulose. Motto from this, never kiss a rabbit. Carnivores, on the other hand, have this relatively short gut, um, the cecum is redundant, remember, because it, there's no need to produce cellulose, they don't, they don't digest cellulose. And this reflects the fact that they basically eat protein, and protein is relatively easy to digest. Next we're going to discuss the other way in which animals are adapted to their diet, and that's through dentition, or their teeth. Now, all animal teeth are based on the same basic layout. Um, and if you have a look at this human skull here, and maybe you could even get a mirror and have a look at your own teeth. In the front, we've got the incisors, and those are basically thin and flat, and they're designed for cutting through food. And then we've got a kind of pointy tooth next to the incisors on either side, and those are the canines. Um, and behind those, we've got the premolars, which kind of have the ridge surface, and the molars also bigger ridge surface. And those are for grinding and crushing the food. If you look at human teeth, they're actually not all that different. They're not highly specialised. And that's basically because we eat an omnivorous diet, so they need to be able to deal with both plant matter and animal. Let's contrast that now with the dog, um, or any sort of carnivore. Now the dentition of the car carnivores are adapted for catching and killing um, and 
slicing up the meat of their prey. How is their dentition adapted to this? Well, what we can see is that they have little tiny um, incisors here, but then these big pointed canines, and these are for stabbing the prey, possibly killing it, and certainly hanging on to it if it's struggling. Behind those we've got the premolars, and then these specially adapted teeth here called the carnassial teeth. Now these act like shears, um, like scissors, to slice through um, the meat. If you look at this part of the jaw here, you can see there's a big attachment for muscles. The muscles run like this. And so you've got a powerful um, biting action. And it prevents the jaws from moving from side to side, which would obviously be disastrous if they'd caught some prey and it was struggling, because it would dislocate the jaw. Herbivores, on the other hand, have teeth that are adapted not for trapping and killing prey, but for grinding up the cellulose so that you break down all the cell walls and release the nutrients from inside the plant cells. This is a grazing animal like a sheep. So what they have are little teeth here, which are the incisors and the canines, and they all look identical in the sheep, just on the lower jaw. And on the top jaw here, they have a kind of horny pad. And they use their lower teeth to rip the grass against the horny pad. And then they push the grass into this gap here, called the diastema. With their tongue, they then move the grass um, from the diastema onto the grinding surfaces of the premolars and the molars. Now again, these are quite different um, to the adapted teeth in the, in the dog. Um, these teeth have ridges on them, and the sheep moves its jaw from side to side rather than up and down, so it grinds the grass across the ridges. As the sheep keep, keeps doing this, then the enamel on the surface wears down, and underneath you get ridges and that makes the grinding process even more efficient. And one final adaptation is that the teeth keep growing throughout the sheep's life. In the dog and humans, that's not the case. But because they're being constantly worn away by this grinding action, then having regrowing teeth is really helpful. The final adaptation that we're going to talk about here is one of herbivores, um, and a group of herbivores called ruminants. And ruminants are things like cows and sheep, which obviously provide a lot of the meat that we eat. Now, you remember when we talked about the rabbit, we said it had a really long gut with that big cecum and appendix in which it had the mutualistic bacteria that were producing cellulases and breaking down the cellulose into beta-glucose. Now, the cow doesn't have that long gut, but what it has is a specially adapted stomach. So, the cow takes in the grass and swallows it, and it goes into the first chamber, which is called the rumen. Now in the rumen, rumen, in the rumen are the mutualistic cellulase producing bacteria. And they produce the enzymes which digest down the cellulose cell walls into glucose. And then in the rumen, the food churns around in here for a while. Anaerobic Respiration produces organic acids, and it's those acids that then get absorbed into the bloodstream of the cow and used um, for energy, used for respiration. Now, what the cow can then do is to kind of regurgitate the, the sort of fermented grass called cud. So the grass will go into this second pouch of the stomach called the reticulum and here it's made into the cud and then it can be regurgitated back into the mouth for further chewing and it'll come back into the rumen. Eventually, once the cud's been fully fermented, it goes into this third chamber called the amazum and this is where the waters reabsorb and then finally into the fourth chamber, called the abomasum, which is the true stomach, if you like, where all the protein-digesting enzymes are called, uh, are stored. 
Now, the pluses of this is, of course, you've got a chamber here in the rumen, which provides the ideal conditions for the mutualistic bacteria and ensures that they don't slip on down the gut and get digested themselves, although obviously a few of them will, and they're, they're quite a valuable source of protein. From the amazum, eventually it will pass into the small intestine, large intestine, and end up as cowpat.